Station Houston on Space Ground 2, uh, are you ready for the event? We're ready for the event, Houston. BBC in the live stargazing series, this is Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is BBC live stargazing series. How do you hear me? And BBC, we've got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Well, thank you, Commander the Wheelock, Flight Engineer Scott Kelly and Flight Engineer Dr. Shannon Walker. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, where are you flying over right now, and how is the view? Well, the views are always spectacular, and we're just coming down on a descending node right around uh, Vancouver, Canada right now. And how long does it take you to complete one orbit of the Earth? Well, we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, about 28,000 kilometers per, uh, per hour. And um, so we orbit the Earth once every 90 minutes. And uh, Colonel Willock, you're commanding ISS Expedition 25. Uh, what will be the highlights of that expedition? Well, probably the biggest highlight is uh, our crew is finally here that com to complement us and, and complete our crew uh, for our, uh, the rest of our journey here. And um, our highlight is really full utilization of the uh, space station as an orbiting laboratory. Uh, we've got uh, several laboratories on board, over 130 uh, science experiments going on, and we're very excited about uh, getting uh, up into full operation. Yes, uh, Dr. Walker, I heard you actually talking down to Houston before we, we linked up, and you were talking about um, where to put sample bottles, I think it was. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about what um, scientific experiments you plan to do when you're on board the space station? Well, we've got a number of scientific experiments from just about every um, scientific field, from material science to uh, astronomy to um, biology and human physiology. And so a lot of what I'm doing actually is the human physiology size, where I'm using myself as a, I'm being used as a test subject to study some of the effects of being in space on the human body. Yeah, and uh, Scott Kelly, I know that one of the highlights when you're up there, or I suppose it's, I don't know what to call it a highlight, will be the last visit of um, the space shuttle to the station. I, I think your brother is uh, flying the space shuttle Endeavour up there. What will that be like? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, my brother will be the, the commander of uh, the space shuttle mission. That actually brings the Alpha Magnetic uh, Spectrometer to the uh, International Space Station, which is a very, uh, uh, very important uh, scientific instrument. And do you, um, will you re regret a little bit the, uh, the shuttle? I mean, when, when Endeavour leaves the station for, for the last time, will you be sad to see that beautiful aircraft grounded? Well, you know, I think most astronauts feel a little bit, um, you know, nostalgic when, when we think about these uh, space shuttles that have been really a uh, uh, significant part of our space program. But, you know, if we're going to move on uh, beyond low Earth orbit, uh, we need to build another vehicle because the space shuttle can't go there. So it's, uh, you know, something that that we might feel a little bit sad about, but at the same time we understand it and uh, we need to move forward. Yeah, how is it? I think, uh, have you all flown on the Soyuz and the shuttle? I wondered uh, how those vehicles felt, you know, how different they are to, to get into space and come back to Earth on the Soyuz and the shuttle. You know, um, both uh, Doug and I have flown on both the, the shuttle and the Soyuz, and this is Shannon's first flight, and she's flown up on the on the Soyuz. Neither of nor Doug or I have flown down. So, um, you know, the the space shuttle is a uh, you know multi mission spacecraft that can do a, a lot of things, um, a lot of different types of missions. It's very complicated. Uh, the Soyuz is, uh, you know, much simpler, and it does 
a few things very, very well, one of which is getting people to and from space. Um, it's, uh, you know, much different in how it flies, how it launches. It's more, you know, it's a rocket that's, uh, or a capsule that's on the top of a rocket versus on the side. The shuttle uh, re-enters and lands uh, in a gliding fashion, whereas the Soyuz lands uh, on land under parachutes. So it's uh, a much, uh, much different system, but both have their uh, advantages and both also have some uh, small disadvantages. You know, you know, I um, envy you all uh, a lot. I mean, I remember the, the the first shuttle flight back in '81, and I remember I actually read recently that John Young, when he landed uh, Columbia, turned to Bob Crippen and said, "You know, Bob, we're really not that far away from the stars." And I thought that reflected beautifully that the optimism in the in the '80s. You know, 20 years after Gagarin first launched into space, and here is this beautiful aircraft flying into space and back again. Do you think? That we are closer to the stars now than we were in the in the early 80s when the shuttle first flew. Um, yes, I believe that we are, and uh, and actually that's the, that's part of the the next the next uh, uh, chapter in this in this story that uh, NASA is writing. Uh, just being able to look forward now, uh, using what research we're doing doing here on the space station. Uh, to project ourselves further out into our solar system uh, to try to discover new things about these uh, materials, about new vehicles, uh, propulsion systems, uh, life support systems, and things like that. And so, and so we're looking beyond and, uh, and hoping to go further and uh, deeper into space. Yeah, I, I wonder if, you know, if we had a, a Kennedy today, a Kennedy-like speech that said, you know, we choose to go to Mars before this decade is out, uh, do you think that we'd be in a position to do that? Do, do we know enough to, to make that next great leap into the solar system now, if, if we had the will and the money? You know, I think there are certain things we're learning on the, the uh, space station here that, uh, particularly with regards to... Um, you know, how humans um, react and how they can be protected against long-duration space flights. So I think we do have a little bit uh, more to learn. We're also learning a lot about how to operate systems, um, life support systems, other systems here that are required for long-duration, uh, long-distance space flights. So, uh, you know, this is a laboratory that does many things, and that's one of them. Um, you know, someday when we do go to Mars, uh, the things we learn here on the International Space Station will be uh, critical to that effort. Um, you know, however, you know, if we had a lot of money to throw at it, I, I think, and I'm somewhat of an optimist that, uh, you know, anything is within our, our grasp. And I think we could, um, you know, go to Mars just like we went to the moon in a very short period of time in the uh, 1960s. So I think it is within our capability to do that if we, if we uh, chose to. And, and what would you say to, to people who, who may not see the, the value of, of, of manned spaceflight, of manned exploration? Now, how, how would you, uh, from, from that wonderful view up there, I mean, you're, you're at the frontier at the moment of, of our, well, you're at the human frontier. How, what about people who, who don't think that human exploration is valuable? Well, I think... Um one thing it's important to get across is how human exploration of space has touched everybody's live, lives on the Earth. There are so many spin-offs and technological developments that have come out of the space program and the human space flight program in particular. So even though they may not see a direct connection, there are a lot of things that um, have made life on Earth a whole lot better, and we need to bring that out so they can understand that it is important. It is a very important uh, scientific endeavor. It's a very important technological endeavor, and it's a very important important human endeavor because as humans we need to keep moving forward as a society and not stagnate. So we need to uh, keep pushing the boundaries and keep exploring. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree with you more, uh, Dr. Walker. And I know that you managed or co-managed NASA's on-orbit engineering office for, for a while. I mean, I suppose those are the, the skills that we've developed in building the space station. Those are the skills we will need to, to fly beyond near-Earth orbit in the future. Exactly. Um, one of the, the key things is learning how to deal with problems because things always um, 
well, a lot of things go wrong, things don't go as planned, and you've got to be able to deal with them um, expeditiously and in, in whatever manner you have. You don't always have all the tools on board that you need or would like to have to solve problems. And so being able to um, fix things and react to things and work around issues is very key to human exploration. Yes, because it's uh, interesting that I, I'm really looking forward to the next Mars mission, which is the, the, the Curiosity rover, which is going to go out there and search for life on Mars. Do, do you see that program, those robotic exploration programs, hopefully as precursors for, for manned landing and exploration of Mars? I think the robotic exploration that we're doing is very important, and um, I think it's also important to not frame the exploration, um, I guess, debate of whether or not we should do it as human exploration versus robotic exploration, because um, both sides of the equation have uh, definite advantages. And yes, we do need to send robotic explorers out there. We've learned so much from all our rovers and all our uh, probes that have gone to the other planets. Um, but we also need to send people there as well to look and see with our own eyes and ears. And could I ask you, Dr. Walker, is this your first trip into space? Yes, this is. This is my first trip into space. And um, I know that you worked, um, I was looking through your, your, your biography, you worked on an, an awful lot of space shuttle missions as a flight controller. Um, how, how does it feel to, to make that leap from being involved in the space program on the ground to actually getting into Earth orbit and, and looking back at the Earth from, from orbit? It was a very interesting transition going from uh, operations and then into the engineering side, the problem solving. So I saw a completely different side of the hardware and then on being as an astronaut back on the operations side. So I've uh, done a lot of things, but it's been absolutely fantastic to actually be up here and um, live and work on the laboratory that I spent so much of my life uh, helping to get built. And uh, uh, Kenna Wheelock, I know that you're um, a very experienced aviator. I think that I read you've flown almost 50 different aircraft in, in your time. But I, I have to ask you, because my growing up, my um, view of the space program, I was born in 1968. It was really the old Wright stuff days, you know, Jaeger and the Mercury 7 astronauts. I mean, today, is it becoming more routine, or, or is there still that, that element of the Wright stuff that you need to be an astronaut? Well, I think it's uh, I think it's becoming more of an uh, an attainable dream for young our young uh, people and our our young students. Uh, when I was I was nine when we landed men on the moon and Apollo 11, and uh, and I remember those days and I was I felt like such an ordinary kid from such an ordinary little place that uh, that that dream of being an astronaut was way too big for me, and um, and of course I I never you know projecting myself out. 30 or 40 years, I never dreamed that I would be here. Um, and I think that's a, uh, that over time, that's a disservice we've done to uh, some of our, our, our youth. And I think we're getting better with that, that it's, uh, that it's, uh, people are realizing that it really is just taking ordinary people with, uh, with an extraordinary dream that, uh, to come together to solve these problems, uh, to work together to move forward. And, um, and I think there, are, there is, uh, more of our society and more of our young people, a, a larger segment that uh, really is beginning to believe in themselves and believe in their in this program and in uh, space exploration in that this type of dream is attainable for them. So I think it's I think things have gotten better. Yeah, you know, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I do think the space program is the 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 ultimate human achievement. I, I, I genuinely do because it is still difficult, isn't it? I mean, if, with, I know that you guys, with your professionalism, are given the appearance of it being routine, a routine thing to get into orbit and come back to Earth again safely. But it, how difficult is it up there? You know, how difficult is it to deal with problems and, and, and fly that beautiful aircraft back to Earth, which I know you've done? Well, actually, it's, it's, I'm smiling because it's a, it's a lot of fun. And, and, and uh, 
no day is routine up here. Uh, space always has a surprise waiting around every corner for us. And um, of course, you may have uh, followed the uh, pump module uh, um, uh, situation that we had back in the end of July when we had to do those three emergency, uh, our contingency spacewalks uh, to get that pump module replaced. And um, it's just interesting, um, the, the things that happen up here because of uh, the exposure to radiation, long-term uh, long uh, exposure to radiation, uh, the, the heating and cooling of this vehicle and everything that's outside. Because we're orbiting the Earth once every 90 minutes, every, every 45 minutes we're getting a sunrise or a sunset. And in direct sunlight, we're seeing temperatures anywhere between 250 and 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And then when we go into eclipse on the uh, backside of the Earth, the uh, temperatures can plummet to uh, two, 75, 300 degrees below zero. And so when you have mechanical systems and, and pieces of hardware that are experiencing that type of heating and cooling, uh, things go wrong and things don't act as they should. And, um, and so it's, it's very, very interesting and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful place uh, for a problem solving mind. And uh, because uh, it, it uh, never ceases to, uh, to disappoint us with the, uh, with the situations that arise. And is, um, you referred to spacewalks there. I mean, are, are they genuinely a different feeling from being inside the shuttle or inside the space station? Do you really feel that, you know, a, a closer connection, I suppose, with the Earth floating down there below you? You really do. There's a, uh, the, the gains uh, get cranked up quite a bit when you open that hatch, and the only thing uh, between you and uh, the vacuum of space is that thin visor. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real eye-opening experience, and it, uh, it takes a little bit of time to kind of get your mind around it. And I don't know if, I suppose that it, you never really do uh, uh, quite, uh, quite grasp uh, the, the, uh, how profound it is what you're doing. Um, so it takes a, li a little bit more focus when you're outside. And uh, of course, it, uh, uh, it's the most encouraging part of, uh, of doing a spacewalk is knowing uh, that you've got a team of people behind you and you can hear them in your headset, and that's very, very comforting because, uh, uh, because uh, there are a, lo a tremendous amount of things uh, that can go wrong out there. Well, well Station, we, we've run out of time, but it was a real pleasure talking to you all. Thank you. I think you are genuinely inspirational, and please keep doing it. Well, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, it's a real pleasure for us to talk to you today. Perfect. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, BBC Live Stargazing Series. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communication.